Perfect. So in our second section, we are looking at another thing that is really important to young people. Um, and it's the idea that sometimes in the interaction, you can feel like you're being put into a box or you're labeled in a way that doesn't really represent you. So I think the most important thing to say is that in a relationship where the roles are very well defined, like teacher and student or parent and child or a practitioner and a young person seeking help, it's quite natural that uh, people concentrate on one particular aspect of the person's identity. Um, and the risk then, though, is to neglect other aspects of the person's identity that may be quite important to how the person is feeling and to what can be achieved in the course of the relationship. So in the mental health context, young people are telling us that sometimes they feel that when they are describing what uh, their issues are, um, the practitioner tends to see them as a problem to be fixed or at a collection of signs or symptoms or a particular type of patient. And this is not by itself something negative, something like this needs to occur in this kind of relationships, but uh, may mean that uh, the practitioner is not actually looking at the complexity of the young person's mental life, doesn't show curiosity as to why the problem has been presenting in the way it is presented to the young person. And the most important effect is that when students are being looked for, what type of support is the most adequate for this particular young person, things are missed out because we have a unidimensional picture of what is happening. Um, this may lead to premature labeling. So not all diagnostic labeling is bad. Uh, young people are, were very clear talking to us that sometimes diagnosis can mean a gateway to support, it can mean relief. But when the diagnosis is too soon, before they've had an opportunity to explain what is happening to them, it's also very constraining for, for them. It's a way of looking at their experience that is limited. And so this is a quote from our young experts um, by experience. Um, and they tell us when you are a young person, your identity is so malleable, it's very easy for a label to become enmeshed with your sense of identity. And I think this is a super important point. Uh, maybe for an adult, the situation is quite different. They have a well-developed sense of who they are. But for a young person uh, who is still in the phase of development, they are still finding themselves being labeled in a certain way can be something they internalize and they start seeing themselves through this label, which is not always uh, helpful. I'm going to show you our first video now. You have already encountered Jack is a young man uh, experiencing suicidal thoughts that um, Rose showed you a video of before. Um, in this particular video, the practitioner labels Jack as not suicidal um, because of some things that Jack shares about his plans. What kind of plans would you have had this evening? I, it was, I'd got a few events on because I'm part of rugby, skiing, and tennis, and they all had different events on tonight that I could have gone to. I see. So we could safely say you're not going to end your life, do something that would have... What, tonight? Yeah, yeah, it... I wouldn't have ended it tonight, no. You wouldn't have. Okay, so maybe there was a bit of miscommunication because they brought you here because they were saying that you were suicidal and... No, I am, but like, I've got... You are. I've got... I've... I feel like I can... I mean, I haven't done it yet. So, again, we are really interested in your reaction. So if you um, go to the chat and tell us how this video makes you feel. And I'm showing you also the transcript in case you've missed anything. Basically, um, the practitioner is uh, trying to work out whether Jack is suicidal and the fact that he mentioned the number of plans that it, so the rugby, skiing and tennis uh, meetings for, for his clubs uh, make the practitioner think that they were not really thinking about ending their lives. Um, but uh, Jack says, you know, I am feeling suicidal and is immediately challenged again uh, by the practitioner. You are, um, you can see that at the end of the transcript. 
So in this case, we feel that it's very important for the practitioner to be to know whether Jack is suicidal or not. And there is a lot of attention to how Jack sees himself. Okay, so in the next uh, video, um, we are going to look at something that is possibly more uh, positive in terms of allowing the young person to express something about the complexity of their lives and the practitioner taking that into account when coming to uh, some kind of decision about the most adequate form of support. So in this case, we've got Dan. Dan is a young man presenting after a suicide attempt. And the practitioner treats his suicidal ideation as something quite complex. But the most important thing is it's related to things that are happening or have been happening to Dan. So it's not something you know separate from his life. Um, and I think you will notice a marked difference in this video, but I'll let you judge for yourself. Um, this video is being reenacted because we didn't have permission to show the original um, one on online. I think from what you said mm -hmm. that you've been struck by a gnat and that is a negative automatic thought. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is since you've left the army, which is something you succeeded to get in the army, you come out of the ar army, but you're in a small town, nothing much is going on. Mm -hmm. You can't go back, you're not going to the gym, mm -hmm. your physical exercise is going down, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's hard for you to get a job, you struggle with your mum because she doesn't understand the situation. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you get this build-up of negative thoughts in your mind. Yeah. Negative thoughts, negative thoughts, all of a sudden, what will happen is, yeah, yeah. what the heck? I'm opening up the medicine cabinet. Okay, so um, hopefully you've been able to um, to see this in the in the post um, meeting interview. Um, the young person said, "I had no one to talk to. I had nothing." And then I spoke to him and the team, and they understood. They actually listened and understood what I was on about. He basically explained why I did it. I didn't know until he told me. It reminds me of what Richard was saying before about the importance of explaining, not just telling people what label belongs to them, but explaining what, why this might have happened based on what they have shared about their experiences. So the interviewer asked, what was the most helpful part of the assessment? And the young person said, the most helpful that they understood me. That's never happened before in my life. No one has actually understood me. Again, a question posed by the interviewer, what would you do if you had suicidal thoughts? Again, talk to someone first. I wouldn't do it, I talk to someone first. So the fact that the young person has been helped uh, to understand what was happening is actually something that um, invites them to seek, uh, seek for help in case uh, a crisis emerges again. So again, we're really interested in your reactions to this video. How did this video make you feel? And the, uh, also the post uh, encounter interview. And I'm just sharing uh, the transcript if you need a reminding of what was happening here. So in the, the practitioner talks about the person having negative automatic thoughts, but he doesn't leave it there. He grounds it in uh, what has happened to the young person leaving the army, not getting support from the family, and just a general buildup of negative uh, thoughts in the young person's mind. Okay, so now I'm going to um, invite the panelists to discuss this with Rachel. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, cool. Um, so my next question then is for you, Ms. Aber. So I'll just read it out to you. So can you tell us when have you felt you were treated like a person rather than just a problem to be fixed? And what difference did this make for you? There was a time when I was younger who, uh, there was a time when I was younger and I was um, going through a lot. I was in care and things were very unstable in my life. However, I've been working with a psychologist for quite a while um, and I guess you could say she was one of the only stable things in my life at that point and I was moving around a lot to different foster carers and she could see that I would 
would come in with different foster carers and it got to a point where I had moved out of the area and so I had to start going to a new hub um, and my psychologist could have easily been like well now you can be passed on to somebody else you're not my problem anymore um but instead she she chose to remain my psychologist and I think she saw the amount of instability I was going through she chose to stay as my psychologist she really went above and beyond um so what she would do is she would travel to the new hub that I had to start going to um and that's something she didn't even have to do um and she said because she didn't want me to have to start new with somebody else um and that's something that I appreciate so much till this day and I think now that I'm out of it I appreciate it more even though I did appreciate it at the time I now can appreciate it so much more and I can see how things might have been worse had that not happened and so I felt like I weren't just a problem that could easily be passed on to somebody else because she really saw me as a person as an individual um yeah so I won't I weren't just been passed on Thank you, Nasaba. That's that's really helpful. Um, yeah, just to make you feel less, not just like a sort of part of the person's caseload. Um, that's really, really helpful. I'll jump on to our next speaker because I am aware of the time. Um, Gemma, so this one's for you. When you do assessments, how do you get to understand people's needs? And do forms or paperwork get in the way of this? Oh, certainly. Absolutely. I think that paperwork is uh, everybody's nightmare. And you find that a lot of people who are anxious about young people and talking to them will opt for the uh, administrative task. So and I think the most important thing is to be candid and honest with the young person because they, they can spot a bluffer a mile off. So when you're looking at your watch and not being terribly interested or not validating that young person, you know, and, and that's why I wasn't sure about the last one, because I think sometimes the young people will say people use a lot of jargon, a lot of sort of medical, medicalized jargon that doesn't make any sense. I suppose I'm thinking of the younger children, really. So, you know, and these platitudes and you're sort of, you know, you're what everybody wants to do is fix the problem. So putting the person in the box saying you're the problem when actually, you know, they're the experts in their own care. And so, you know, like accepting that sometimes you can't just fix it. You know, there isn't you can't fix it and not, and not pretending that you've got all the answers, but say, you know, say you're both going to embark on a journey of a mutual respect for each other and try and understand, you know, well, how they to, but not sort of, you know, saying, you know, all the answers and all that sort of thing. And I think it's also very important to say to the young person that self-harm is not an illness per se, but it's something, it's a communication of something or other, and that, you know, it can change and, you, you know, there's a continuum, you might feel, like mostly about cutting as a way of, of managing your emotions, but certainly, you know, you're also at risk of, of feeling like wanting to end your life. And you suppose for the assessment, it is very important to tease that out. So as much as you'd like to, you know, you do have the, some sort of uh, expectation that you are able to make a thorough assessment of what's going on as well as, and to do that with a young person, I think it's quite hard when it comes to issues around confidentiality, actually. And when you're saying to the young person, so say, for example, the, the mum, I'm thinking of very much younger children, I suppose, that's why I'm, mine was mostly, you know, 16 and under, and about involving parents and how you do that in a very sensitive way by saying to them, do you want your parents to come in? Do you want to tell them what, what we've talked about? You know, and, and that's very, it's a very sort of fine line about how much to uh, maintain confidentiality whilst keeping the young person safe and being able to, you know, acknowledge that it's very much dependent on them and what they say, you know, and how they are feeling and you know what kind of things they've tried in the past and all of that sort of thing. I have to say I'm not very good on papers on, I usually and I think it's very bad when you see say some junior members of staff coming in with a tick list saying do you feel like this do you feel you know often the NHS relies very heavily on risk factors and I think I'd be much more inclined to look towards what's protective in that young person you know what and I have seen somebody who's very acutely suicidal I have said, is there anything that would stop you? Is there anything that would stop you following this through? And that is such a telling and important question. 
So, you know, they say, well, actually, I wouldn't because I couldn't do that to my mum. I think, oh, right. You know, or, you know, those kind of things, asking questions in a sort of, a, well, I suppose, reverse psychology type thing where you ask them what would and what would help and all of those kind of things. But very much seeing them as the expert in how to and that you're just uh, guiding that process and explaining to them in, in all honesty about when what kind of stuff you do write down in their notes and, you know, that they are allowed to see their notes at some point later on in the life, and that you know it's not an illness at all. It's about an expression. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I like that. Um, seeing them as the expert, I think that will resonate a lot with with some of our young people here today. Actually, thank you, Gemma. Um, I'll jump on to the last speaker for this section then. So this is for Sajja. Um, so my question is, how do you think we can make changes in schools to better support students as individuals with a range of needs? Thanks, Rachel. I think it's really important to remember that children spend and young people spend an awful long time in school during the week. They're, they're in school for something up to 35 to 37 hours a week. And for many young people, school is a secure base. And for many young people, it's where they first feel comfortable and safe to identify that something doesn't feel right for them. And I think it's really important that staff have capacity and staff are upskilled to understand, to be able to pick up the signs of what's normal adolescent behaviour and what's different? And when do I need to start taking some action to enable this young person to feel safe enough to come and talk to me and ask me some questions as well? I think teachers need to also be available and be present and have a real sort of non-judgmental attitude towards uh, talking to young people and sharing a common language so a young person can choose a trusted adult in school to go and talk to them about how they feel and know they're going to get the same response, regardless of whether they speak to the special educational needs coordinator, whether they speak to the safeguarding lead, whether they speak to the head teacher or the caretaker, they're going to get the same response in terms of someone's going to listen, someone's going to understand, and someone's going to be able to use a language that they understand to guide them towards uh, seeking further support as well. Um, I think it's also, again, really important for schools, and I think a couple of colleagues have already said this, about schools starting from an asset-based approach, what's going well, what works, where are those really strong connections, where are, as Gemma said, those protective factors, what are the protective factors, and as a school environment, how can we increase those protective factors for young people, so young people can access support before they actually hit crisis, and before they actually end up with a referral being made to uh, statutory services for some further support so it's really thinking about let's look at early intervention let's look at an environment in school where we really promote preventative uh, methods uh, preventative attitudes towards mental health really ensuring as I said before having a real common language and mental health is something that we talk about emotional health and well-being it's something we talk about as we talk about our physical health and not a conversation we have with young people when something goes wrong so let's start to normalise those conversations and have um, a mentally healthy environment where children feel safe enough to ask for support as and when they need it. Super. Thank you, Sajja. And I think, as you say, it all starts with having um, access to that trusted adult, which is so important. And I know, again, that resonates with what uh, some of our young people said in our, in our meetings. Um, OK, then I'm going to hand back to Lisa to wrap up with some top tips for this section. All right. So here are our top um, that we just heard a lot of this, but uh, just to summarize, as young people say it's important to them. For the practitioner to fully explore their concerns, uh, family and school, um, before offering a label. To acknowledge that the young person is an individual and their story matters in the way they want to tell their story. Um, providing a well-founded diagnosis um, is good, can be validating but premature labels uh, may cause lasting damage. So we need to be careful of that. Um, and for the practitioner to be able to explain that the label is just one part of the bigger picture. It doesn't summarize the person. Uh, it doesn't exhaust or reduce into one thing, but there are lots more there um, to pay attention to. And finally, to conclude with a quote from our young people, life is hard, and instead of them dealing with it in a more holistic way, they just, they've just been put into this box. It's like a simple explanation for something that has many complexities. 